Dr. Mahmoud Ganum, welcome to the show. I'm so happy to be welcoming you to the Better Podcast today. Thank you very much. I was really looking forward to meet you and chat with you today. Wonderful. And we're going to be talking about your latest uh, paper um, around COVID, around depression and the role of the microbiome in depression and some of the solutions that we might be, um, that we might consider, especially in this post-pandemic um, world. And I'm really excited. The paper is very thorough. I've had a look through it. Um, really appreciated all the citations that were in there, which set me on a bit of a, you know, a little bit of a rabbit <laughs> hole as they sometimes do. Um, sure. But before we, before we get to that, I think it would be wonderful uh, for people who have, who are unfamiliar with your work. And I was saying to you before we started recording, you have a very interesting uh, story and I would love for you to just explain how you came to work work uh, in the microbiome, a little bit about your history. I know that you uh, used to live in Kuwait and now I believe that you're, that you're in the U.S. I believe you're in Cleveland uh, now, but maybe you can talk a little bit about, uh, about your origin story and how you came to work sure. and how you came to be known as Dr. <laughs> microbiome. <laughs> yeah, that's great, really. Do you know, I am so lucky because as you mentioned, uh, my life saw some turbulence. So what happened, the story is I was professor at Kuwait University in microbiology. And I was on holiday in England. Usually, you know, because uh, Kuwait is very hot in the summer. So we used to leave and go to Europe, to Cyprus and whatever. And we were on holiday and lo and behold, Saddam Hussein decided to take the country and it happened overnight, you know? Right. So that was amazing because you can imagine somebody going to Costa Rica and then suddenly you cannot come home. It's time to go home and you cannot, and uh, so I lost my, my job, my livelihood, and well, the good news, my family were with me. And then what happened, I was fortunate because before the invasion of Kuwait, I used to work on uh, garlic, believe it or not. This friend of mine who is a Kuwaiti, a member of our faculty in the university, every day came to me, you have to study garlic. I say, leave me alone. I don't want to study <laughs> garlic. He said, no, no, this is good. People who take garlic and they, they don't have candida in their mouth. Because he didn't leave me, he, I published three papers on garlic and I was invited before the invasion to give a talk at the Willard Hotel in DC in the first Congress in the biology of garlic. So I had my visa, I had everything ready, and I was about to go back to Kuwait. My family stayed there and I come to America. So I, of course, all this appeared suddenly with Saddam taking over the country. So what I did is I called the organizer and they sent me a ticket to come to uh, the US to uh, give my talk. And then of course, I start looking uh, for a job. And I went to the National Institute of Health there is a Dr. Jack Bennett, who was the head of the mycology, because, you know, I am a, I study fungi, so I am a fungi. I called him, I say, listen, I lost my job, I need a job. And the guy was so kind, I tell you something. And he said, look, come after two weeks, and then we have a big meeting here on fungus, and you can meet everybody. On my way to the hotel, I said, I can't do it because I don't have money to stay. I saw a travel agent, you know, and uh, I went to him, he is an African-American. I said to him, listen, you are African-American, you have to help me. He looked at me, what, what do you want? You know, I said, listen, I need to come here and uh, because there is a possibility of me getting a job. And uh, Mr. Darcy, what he did, he changed my ticket, believe it or not. And I was able to come back to DC and meet all these people at Dr. Uh, Jack Bennett's house. And I got two jobs that evening, what, one at UCLA, one at Wayne State in Detroit. And I took uh, the UCLA and I tell you it's history after this. Luckily, uh, my son wrote about it in Facebook, you know, these days social media. Yes. And we were able to meet the family uh, of Mr. Darcy and thank them. And that was really, a life changing experience. And you know, maybe because these days we are living with COVID and we have all this uh, uh, anxiety and stress, it gave me a new way to look at life. You know, you should be optimistic because there are such good people and they always can help you. And really this is the message to anybody. 
look, we need to be optimistic. We are going to come out of COVID and we will be great. And don't forget, even though sometimes you meet people not so nice, there are great people who always will be ready to help you. I love that story so much. And I think, you know, I, I, I try to, in my social media, whenever I am interacting with social media, to try to find stories like that, because it's so easy to find the doom and the gloom and the world is coming to an end. But there's, you know, men and families like Mr. Darcy and his family who are, you know, are, are generous and, you know, can change a travel ticket at their own expense. I mean, I would like to think that if someone came up to me and said, listen, I have absolutely no money. I need you to help me out that I would, that I would do the same thing. So, um, kudos to you. And, and, you know, maybe there's some, uh, you know, we can, we're going to talk a little bit about the microbiome as well, but you know, maybe there was some resonance, you know, some yes. like vibrational <laughs> synergies between you and him. And he saw some potential, Definitely. uh, in you and, and, you know, to, to come back to your work, you know, you have been cited, I believe it's over 38,000 times in the literature for your work on the microbiome, you actually coined the term mycobiome. So M uh, Y or M I C O yes, biome. M-Y, yes. M-Y. So let's, let's maybe talk a little bit about the microbiome. And then I want to talk about your, and then we can start, start to move towards this recent paper that you published, because I think it's, this is, this is important. Often when we talk about the microbiome, we, we talk about bacteria. We're talking about, you know, we're talking about all about the bacteria and like the opportunistic bacteria and the healthy bacteria, but we, we forget some of the other kingdoms I believe that exist. So let's talk a little bit about what the microbiome is and what is the relationship between that and the bacteria that we that we house in our gut? Sure. I really, I'm so glad you asked this question. First of all, let's define what is the microbiome. Microbiome refers to the micro, microbes that lives on and in our body, like on our skin, in our gut, in our oral cavity, in our reproductive system. We have germs there. The good news about these germs, they can be beneficial and they can help us, okay? At the same time, if they are out of balance, then they could cause issues. Now, one thing which is very important, when I used to go to meetings, the first time when the microbiome idea came, everybody everybody talks about bacteria, bacteria. And that brought me back to when I was a young man starting my doctorate in England. My supervisor or mentor, as you call him here, he gave me a paper. He said, this is what you want to work on. And what it was, it was about a rabbit treated with an antibiotic or steroids for that matter, anti-inflammatory agent. And guess what happened? With the antibiotic, they killed the bacteria and then the rabbit became susceptible to infection, fungal infection. Fungi started to take this opportunity and cause disease. And a lot of people know about that uh, because they know about candida, for example. So that, when I went to this meeting, I said, no, no, we really need to start talking not only on bacteria, but also on other microbes that live there, the communities that live together and interact together. And very interesting, up till uh, one month, two months ago, I was invited to give a talk at the Forsyth Institute in Boston. And guess what? They wanted me to speak in a meeting called the microbiome beyond bacteria. Mm -hmm. They just figured out it's very important that we should look at fungi as well, as well as viruses as well. So in our, these microbes, bacteria, fungi, as well as viruses and archaea, this one small cell, all of these communities of microbes as if they live in a city and they interact with each other. Okay. So that's, I hope, and when, we, when I uh, thought about the fungi, the study of fungi called mycology, MY, mycology. That's why I thought we should call this the mycobiome, which talks to, uh, about, which describes the uh, fungal community that live in our body. Wonderful. And then when we talk about the fungi or the fungi, there's in the same way that when we think about bacteria, there are passive, happy little critters. And then there's also opportunistic, more aggressive bacteria. The same is true for the fungi, correct? We have opportunistic, more pathological uh, that can create disease and other ones that are there sort of keeping, you know, competing and keeping the bacteria in check, correct? 
Absolutely. This is very important point because a lot of the time people, when they think about fungi, they think all oh, about candida, which is bad news. Okay. In fact, in our body, like you rightly mentioned, we have good fungi such as saccharomyces, uh, which is the baking yeast, the one the yeast we use to make bread as well as to make beer, for example. These are the good guys. But you could have candida, which is a which could cause disease. But here it's very important, subtle differences, which I want to talk about. 50 so 70% of people carry candida in their gut or in their mouth, but they are at low level or low abundance. In this case, they are not bad at all. You know, in fact, they could help us and they could work with bacteria to help each other so that the beneficial organisms grow. What happens if we, take, for example, an antibiotic, as I mentioned in the case of the rabbit, or we become immunocompromised cancer patients, transplant patients, and this sort of thing. What happens, the candida will take the opportunity to overgrow. When it overgrows, then it can cause problem. So to me, I would look at it, these fungi could be good or bad, depending on the level they are in, and also the good or fungi such as Saccharomyces can keep the bad one under control. The fungi and bacteria, they, they serve complementary roles in the gut. I've heard you talk about this idea that, you know, fungi, for example, or fungi, they, they break down complex carbohydrates, right? And then bacteria yes. tend to break down more simple carbohydrates. And the Saccharomyces that you just uh, mentioned, these will, uh, they are like yeast eating, like in the, in, in the um, context of uh, bacteria, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii, I believe, is like the yeast eating bacteria. So like there's this like they compete almost like to keep each other in check but there's also this overlap of complements like there's complementary roles that they both have yes absolutely absolutely that's the nice way to look at it it's complementary role if they are in balance they help each other where we start having issues if we come let's say we have the good bacteria such as lactobacillus you go kill it then what happens we'll start to increase the you know when you kill it, this, the role of this lactobacillus is, is like a policeman. It keeps the candida under control. It does not allow it to overgrow. So everything is hunky-dory. But when you kill it, candida then, because without those policemen available there, it starts to overgrow and cause issues. You see? So it's really a delicate balance between them. And our job is to try to see how we can maintain this balance and increasing the beneficial bacteria as well as the saccharomyces, the fungi, while reducing or curtailing the ability of the pathogens to increase in number and cause issues. Yes. And to your point around the antibiotics, I mean, I think that hopefully there's, you know, we're, we're starting to see like bacteria resistant, like antibiotic resistant bacteria because of this overuse of antibiotics. And we were mentioning, you know, when you take an antibiotic, you're wiping out the good, the bad and the ugly, like all the bacteria is gone, which will leave, you know, the, the body more vulnerable to things like candida overgrowth, as you were saying, or more fungi or fungi overgrowth. Um, and this this kind of brings us a little bit closer to your your paper, your more recent paper, because you were talking about COVID-19, which is, of course, is a virus, um, but sometimes... Um, uh, medical doctors can be guilty of just prescribing an antibiotic when there's any sort of symptoms whatsoever. And so I would love to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and what some of your observations have been in terms of the gut, because we often think about, you know, we've all heard of the ACE2 receptor. I want you to talk about that. Uh, but we often think about how COVID-19 will invade respiratory passages like the nasal cavity and it kind of gains access via the olfactory, uh, you know, the cribriform plate and, it, you know, it can, it can infect sort of the cranial nerves and so forth. But how can COVID, uh, what are some of the implications of COVID-19 and gut health and, and potential uh, implications from, uh, in terms of the microbiome? I mean, as you uh, mentioned, really we know a lot about respiratory syndromes when we have COVID infection. However, studies are starting to show that there are also gastrointestinal symptoms 
in a number of COVID-19 patients. So what then other studies are started to show when you look at the microbiome that lives in these patients, they have a decrease in microbiome diversity. In other words, for the cells really to, or for the microbiome to be effective, it needs to be diverse, okay? Now, once you limit this diversity, you are encouraging the growth of the bad or pathogenic organisms. So in these patients, they have decreased diversity, but also they found that there is decrease in the beneficial organisms or the microbes that are good and uh, an increase in the pathogenic ones. So it's the opposite is happening. And then you mentioned uh, about the ACE2. ACE2, as you know, this enzyme helps COVID to enter the uh, human cells. But it also studies are starting to show not only it plays a role in COVID infection, but also plays an important role in regulating the gut microbiome in, in the gut. So you can see this very intricate relationship of COVID with our microbiome. So when you talk about decreased microbiome diversity, we're talking about bacteria and fungi. We're talking about all the different kingdoms. Or are we specifically talking about bacteria? A lot of the studies, as you know, really focus on bacteria. Okay. But I can tell you if uh, studies to try to look at the fungi in the microbiome have not been shown. However, there are studies to show that patients with uh, COVID, they are having more uh, fungal infections, such as mucor, mucoralis, okay? So definitely there is an imbalance in the fungi as well, but people did not look at the gut uh, microbiome diversity. What they looked at, they looked at, oh, these COVID patients seems to have couple of infections which uh, with fungi. One, I mentioned muca, a mucor infection, but also aspergillus infection. So we know that there is imbalance in these patients with respect to the fungal micro, microbiome. And in the paper you were talking about, you just mentioned this, but I, I thought we might uh, expand on it a little bit more, that a, this ACE2 uh, not only plays a role in, uh, in, the, in the COVID-19 infection, like the ability for the virus to invade uh, the cell, but as you mentioned, it plays an important role in regulating the gut microbiome, which then in turn is going to uh, change the hosts uh, or the, you know, the person who's infected with it, uh, it's going to change their immune immune response and their gene expression. Can you expand a little bit about on how that, how that might be occurring? Like what are the changes that we might see in the immune system? What are some of the genes or do we know at this point, like what are some of the genes that may be being turned on or off? I can tell you, this is very important point. Why? Because remember these organisms, even though we said they live there, they do additional uh, things. They secrete some metabolites. Metabolites are small molecules, like small compounds. For the most known of them is uh, what's called short chain fatty acid, like a butyric acid, for example. Okay. And these, these uh, metabolites, they play very important role. Not only they can help in maintaining the integrity of our gut lining, you know, the epithelial cells that cover our, uh, our intestinal tract. They get affected uh, positively if we have microbes that live there and can, and can really produce them. You know, but beneficial organisms, that's what they do. In addition to that, they really can, by going through the gut lining, these metabolites, they go into the bloodstream and they start to affect our immune system. So their effect not only localized to our gut, but also could go up to the brain, for example. And that's why we have gut brain access. And that's why we may have if, uh, a depression, which linked to our, you know, dopamine and other uh, neurotransmitters, you know, uh, serotonin and, and uh, you know, all these uh, type of uh, uh, hormones and, as I said, neurotransmitter are affected by the gut. So you have not only localized effect, but we have a systemic effect as well. And so let's talk a little bit about how this relates 
to depression and what I think is going to be, uh, and I think it already is really a, a pandemic in its own right, which is mental health. Um, as a result of uh, the, uh, as a result of the pandemic and the lockdowns and the unemployment and the inflation, all the things, the sort of the economic you know, bruja that's, that's happening now. Uh, in, in your paper, I'll just read a couple of stats, which I thought were staggering, uh, in your intro, in the intro of your paper. And we'll make sure that this paper also is linked in the show notes, just for, uh, those of you that are wanting to read it. It's a fantastic piece. Uh, within one, within a one month period at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, a reported 34.1 increase in prescriptions for anti-anxiety meds, 18.6 increase in antidepressant prescriptions, 14.8% increase in common anti-insomnia drugs. So, uh, I, I won't read all of these, but things that are going to, things, th things that are going to help people fall asleep. And we can make, when we talk about sleep, I want to maybe come back to this point that these, uh, insomnia, these medications for sleep, you're not actually sleeping. You're just in a state of unconsciousness. <laughs> um, and then further in the paper, you said a reported three, like this, this shocked me, 338% increase in the call volume, uh, maybe like a support line for individuals experiencing emotional distress from February, 2020 to March, 2020, and then an 891% increase compared to the call volume of the previous year, March, 2019. So we have a problem like, the, and this is, and you know, maybe it was the acuteness of it, but I remember like you couldn't, and we'll get to diet, but you couldn't find flour in the shops. Like you couldn't, everyone was like, you know, baking and like making all of these comfort foods. So let's talk a little bit about what you outline in the, in the paper called COVID stress syndrome. What is this and what does it look like clinically? I mean, First of all, it's really lovely that you went through what, what happened, like the, to put the problem into perspective, that the fact that this pandemic is an, uh, have great effect on our mental health and really should be at the front and center of how we can deal with this. Now, with, when, with respect to the stress, as you can imagine, there are very clear evidence that if somebody is stressed, they can suffer from depression, okay? And for 40 years, we know that stress alters the gut microbiome, okay? And what I mean alter, it means they favor the pathogenic bacteria, those bacteria and fungi for that matter, that cause infection, okay? Now, when you looked at the stress, have a number of effects, first of all, the first thing happens when a person is stressed, they start to secrete more uh, inflammatory cytokines, that such as a good example is IL-6, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and this can regulate the inflammation. It will increase the inflammation, okay? Also, it has, studies have shown that stress can affect really the intestinal barrier. Remember, it's very important that our intestinal uh, lining or intestinal barrier should be intact. It should not allow things to go in and out at, at their at will, okay? And that's what we call leaky gut, okay? So because when we don't have a, a good gut lining, okay, there is some holes in it, things, toxins start to go in and out at, as they wish, you know, which means we are going to suffer from that. Also, when you look at the in, in, uh, uh, hormones I mentioned, like for example, in response to stress, our hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, uh, as you call it, HPA uh, axis, start to produce cortisol, okay? And as you know, cortisols are really built in alarm system. It's what we have, what we call fight or, uh, fight or flight. We get ready, our body becomes so in tune, either you run away or you have so much energy, you fight it, okay? So all of this is really linked to the, uh, the uh, uh, depression, okay? Because once you have these effects, we'll start to have neurological issues, including, as I said, uh, depression. 
Yes. And, you know, depression is multifactorial, right? We're not, you know, I think that oh, yeah. it's, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex, there's many different uh, reasons why someone might become depressed, but I would, I would have as an overall comment, uh, you know, just thinking about some of those stats that I just, uh, that you, that you had mentioned in your paper, I think depression in general is poorly served by pharmaceuticals. Uh, and you go through some of this in your paper as well, like 30 to 40% of depressed patients do not respond to the first line antidepressants. Sometimes they, you know, up to 70% of the time, they don't achieve complete remission of the symptoms. Uh, and then sometimes the, the, the side effects, you know, some of the side effects from the pharmaceuticals are so severe that they negate the patient's ability to continue on them. And we've had a couple of uh, psychiatrists on the podcast uh, sort of challenge this traditional model of just like writing a script for Zoloft or writing a script, yeah. script for Wellbutrin as the solution. And I really appreciated your paper and your overall holistic approach, because you, you weren't just advocating. I mean, of course, you know, if someone is, if there's a severe major depressive episode, you know, and they, they just need those, that temporary potentially lift in serotonin, let's say, if they're taking an SSRI, uh, to sort of get them through wonderful. But I think that there needs to be more of a complete, a approach to the human uh, that's in front of us. And you outline some of the different verticals like diet and exercise and sleep. And I wanted to maybe start to parse into each of those uh, and, and get your opinion um, on how we can be using these as tools in addition to or in replacement of, um, you know, pharmaceuticals as a long-term strategy. So why don't we, why don't we talk a little bit about, um, uh, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about, first, let's talk about diet. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, at the start of the pandemic, if, you know, if I went to the grocery store and I was trying to find like flour, like they were all like, everyone was baking, right. Uber eats, yes. you know, like used to be, <laughs> you know, used to be like, you know, a handful of restaurants on there and just Uber eats like exploded, like every, cause all restaurants were closed. They all went to Uber eats. And then you could have like hundred, literally hundreds of restaurants at your, you know, phones, you know, at your fingertips. So talk to us about some of the different parameters of diet. And then if you can integrate that in terms of the effect on the microbiome, and I would love for you to like touch on alcohol consumption and like some of these processed foods that I was mentioning. Sure, sure. I, I, I really, I really love the way you uh, set these questions and also you give the background, which will help the listeners to uh, understand this. First of all, I, I really totally agree with you that if you need treatment or medication for severe cases of depression, always go and see your clinicians, okay? It's very important. However, with our understanding now of the microbiome and this sort of thing, we need to have a broader approach. So in addition, an alternative approach, not, not totally to replace what you need in, in, in cases of severe depression, for example, but at the same time, we can do something in our hand to try to improve this. And one of the things which you mentioned is the diet. And if you think about it, why are we talking about diet and depression? Because it is well established, there are studies to show that people, for example, who have high intake of sugar or refined carbohydrates, they feel depressed. Conversely, People who, are, who eat, uh, have a healthy eating habit really are associated with decreased risk of depression. And there are all the other studies which showed, for example, people who follow the Mediterranean diet, it really can help in them dealing with the depression. So to me, what we need to do is we need to have a diet that can reduce the inflammatory response and increase the anti-inflammatory response. And to address this, I wrote a book, which is called Total Gut Balance, really where I wanted to show how we can use diet to basically balance our microbiome, because by balancing the microbiome, both bacteria and fungus, you are gonna have a better situation in your gut and hopefully overall health. So you may ask, okay, what type of food to eat to reduce depression? Okay, there are 
clear guidelines which people could follow. For example, try to have protein with every meal and the snack you have. Try to use good oils and fat, like for example, coconut oil, or, you know, I am from the Mediterranean, very, uh, uh, extra virgin olive oil, fantastic with garlic and lemon and <laughs> there's this, garlic again <laughs> 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 yes and and then of course i always advocate to have resistant starch you know resistant starch so it's not like don't have any carbohydrate try to have complex carbohydrates such as you can find in bananas especially in the ripened way or in oat corn legume beans i love lentils for example it's really really very good the other thing which can help you is fruits and vegetables. You know, these days at lunchtime, honestly, all what I take is fruits and vegetables. I love tomatoes. When I was a little boy, I wasn't feeling well. And I, my mom sent me to my granny. You know, granny always <laughs> helped. And what she did, she gave me to eat tomatoes from the mountains, which are, oh my goodness, fantastic. So now you find me having tomatoes, bananas, apples, all, all these fruits and vegetables are really very, very important, you know? Now, the other thing which I think also is very good is if you can take some nuts, for example, pistachio. Pistachio have been shown to be even better than almonds in rebalancing the microbiome, okay? By 10, 10 30 in the morning, uh, because I'm an early riser, I, I feel hungry, so what I do, I have a bag of uh, pistachio or other mixed nuts and I have a, a bunch of that and it really allows me to continue, you know? So these are some of the good stuff to eat, but there are other things you need to avoid because remember what we want to do is we need to limit the growth of the pathogens, those that can cause us a problem, but we need to encourage the, the, the growth of the beneficial one. So you need to avoid certain food. For example, no added sugar. Uh, studies have shown, especially with candida, candida, the fungus candida loves sugar. Mm -hmm. Also, there is another bacteria phylum, it's called the protobacteria, which is a red flag for inflammation. Guess what? Loves sugar. In fact, we did a study and we published it where we looked at sweeteners, you know, artificial sweeteners. Yes. We did, uh, they really increase the growth of protobacteria. And because of this, it's bad. I recommend completely to avoid these sweeteners. And the sweeteners All, you're talking about are the non-nutritive sweeteners like the Splenda and the Sweet and Low and the Aspartame. Exactly, okay. exactly. And yes. we did that in the study on Splenda. I think it's open access. So, uh, people can access it. If put my name and this sort of thing and okay. photobacteria, it, it can come out. Also, no processed cured meat, because as you know, all of these, they have so much additives and preservatives and, and salt, which is not good. Or we, uh, with respect to the fat and oil, I only recommend the, as I mentioned, coconut oil, uh, extra virgin olive oil. These are really very good. Then finally with alcohol. I don't say don't drink at all, but you know, apart from the fact that drinking too much alcohol has other uh, cardiovascular issues and other issues for our liver and this sort of thing, I recommend maybe if you like to enjoy a glass of wine, maybe three times a week, a glass of wine is great, you know? Uh, because there are studies to show that like in Italy, people who drink this red wine, you know, they well, do It's a French well. paradox, right? The French <laughs> exactly. have red wine and cheese. <laughs> like, exactly. And they live so long and they're happy, you know? Yeah. Uh, so these are the overall uh, like outline of what to eat and not to eat. I love, I love what you're saying. I think um, one of the through lines of this podcast is we are really trying to find and help the listeners find a way to eat that is in line with their biology, as in line with their lifestyle. And I think, you know, talking about the Mediterranean diet, I think a lot of times, um, you know, what we're, we're starting to hear now, you know, for a while it was like, eat for your genetics. And yes, that's true. But it's, I think it's more important to sort of eat like your grandmother did. You know, you mentioned your grandmother would give you a tomato. And I actually remember uh, that was my snack, a little bit of tomato <laughs> and salt. Like I ate it like an apple, right? Loved, yeah. loved tomatoes. And yeah. I think that um, if we can sort of look back ancestrally to where we come from in the world, you know, like my, I'm Mediterranean as well. I'm Portuguese and Lebanese. So ah. I have, you know, very, 
very much, uh, you know, lots of fish, lots of lentils, lots of yes. vegetables, olive oil. You know, we were basically baptized in olive oil. So, yes. Yes. Um, these are, these are foods that my biology requires and expects to some degree, right. Versus yes. someone who, um, I'm trying to think of, you know, maybe someone, uh, you know, close to the equator would be having, as you mentioned, lots of coconut oil because that's native to their land. And all of these things are going to reduce inflammation. And I love that you mentioned this because I think that we don't, you know, we sort of throw around the word inflammation like we do stress. It's like, oh, don't be stressed, manage your stress, don't be inflamed, eat an anti inflammatory diet. But some of the physiological impacts of being inflamed all the time, having interleukin six, as you mentioned, some of these other, um, some of these other cytokines that are always elevated, your body is always going to be diverting energy to be trying to quell that fire. And if we can, and if we are always inflamed, you're always going to feel bagged and you're probably also going to reach for more crappy foods. It's like the worse you eat, it's like a vicious cycle. The worse you tend to crave more, of these, t- more of these types of foods as well. Would you, would, is that your observation as well? Absolutely. I think honestly, uh, great what you mentioned. First of all, is as you say, if we go back, I, I can tell you when I was a little boy uh, growing up in Lebanon, my mom used to go in the morning to the local uh, shop, the produce, she buys the fresh produce, she goes to the butcher, get the stuff, she goes to the, you know, uh, uh, supermarket, like it's all small, <laughs> small uh, uh, shops where she gets her own grains and the rice and whatever, and she cooks them. We, we ha- I come from a big family, like we are seven uh, children and my mom and dad, you know, so she cooks for them. She knows what is there. It's all fresh and this sort of thing. Now, unfortunately with our life, you know, it's a speed. The, uh, my, my, my mom was at home where now, as you know, women need to do work. They need to take care of kids. It's really very hard. But I think if we can change a little bit to try to bring some of this old habits back it's going to help uh, really tremendously, really tremendously. And uh, with respect to the inflammation, in fact, I, I prepared a, a module lecture to talk about microbiome and inflammation and how it's all tied up together. You know, mm-hmm. so you are absolutely right what you mentioned. Let's talk a little bit about biofilms. I know that, um, I I think that this might be a good place for it because I, you know, when we, when we're eating foods, let's say that are very processed, you know, even things like protein bars where we think, oh, look, they're healthy, it has protein in them. They have emulsifiers in them that are going to change, you know, the receptor sites and all, you know, they're going to change the sort of the constitution of the microbiome. How can, um, explain to us what a micro, uh, sorry, explain to us what a biofilm is and what is the role that they play and how does that come from processed foods potentially? Sure. You know, first of all, biofilms, I really did a lot of studies on biofilms from the medical point of view. When I first started to look at the biofilms, it, it was to do with the, when you go to a hospital, like for example, a patient uh, is in intensive care, they put so many catheters, so many stuff. And guess what happened? These microbes, they stick, adhere or stick to the catheter and they start to form biofilms. But to make it simple so that everybody knows what is a biofilm, the plaque in our teeth is a biofilm. Every morning we brush our teeth Why we are trying to get rid of this slimy layer in our teeth, which is a biofilm, okay? We all know biofilm. If you go to uh, the marina, for example, you look at outside of a ship, the slimy material is a biofilm. So what it is, it's microbes, they come together, they start to, first of all, they stick to a surface. And in this gay, let's go to our gut. They, they stick to our gut surface, the gut lining, and then they start to produce what, what you call a, uh, what you call like carbohydrates, okay, matrix. They make a matrix. It's like a jello. And inside this jello, you have all these M&Ms, which are the microbes, okay? But when these M&Ms are inside or germs inside this jello, they become protected. In other words, you cannot get rid of them by using antimicrobial, antibiotic, for example, if it's bacteria. And you need to get rid of this uh, jello 
to be able to get into the germs inside, okay? And what we found when we did the study in Crohn's disease patients, we found that there is an increase of bacteria, E. coli, and Serratia marcescens, as well as the fungus Candida tropicalis. And then we took it a step further. When we put them together, guess what happened? They formed a thick biofilm. So you can imagine having your teeth with a lot of plaque on them. Okay, if you don't brush for two, three days, you can imagine it become, become thick. So that's what happens when these three or pathogens came together, they formed a lining in the gut, which of course, it changed their character. It's amazing what happens when they are alone, they don't change as much, but when, when they come together, they start speaking and communicating with each other, and then they start to change their shape. Like candida, for example, starts to form uh, like tubes or filaments, and these tubes start to break down our gut lining. And remember what happens when we have break down the gut lining, we have leaky gut, and then we start to have health issues, okay? So this is the biofilm, uh, is the ability of these pathogens to come together and form a layer on our gut lining, which start to cause issue, issues with uh, causing disease, our leaky gut, as well as they don't allow the nutrient to be absorbed as efficiently as they should be. Right, right. And it's, you know, it's like the old saying, it's not you are what you eat, it's are what you can absorb and transport, right? It's not exactly. what you eat. And if you have this sort of mucus, this jello, as you were saying, per, like sort of making a, a barrier from the microvilli to the, from the, to the lumen, then you're not going to be able to make use of the nutrients that you're making. And then the other thing that I've, I've heard you talk about, which I think is so interesting is being embedded in that jello, being embedded in that mucusy film. It also is hard for the immune system to penetrate that. And then that also propagates its own set of issues, correct? Uh, correct. I mean, I, I just mentioned about that. You cannot get rid of them with antibiotic, but definitely also we did a study where we put this biofilm and we'll put some uh, immune cell like of phagocytes and these phagocytes, they could not come and engulf the bacteria and the fungus. Okay. So definitely not only you, they become uh, sort of resistant to antibiotics or antifungal, anti but also they become resistant to our immune system, cannot come and take care of them. Let's talk about exercise. You also mentioned exercise in this paper. Um, and, you know, I often, we often see exercise compared to antidepressants in terms of its efficacy. It has about, you know, 30%, uh, you know, it's it same sort of as antidepressants, sort of a 30% success rate. Um, and you write in the, in the paper that exercise can alleviate depression through various uh, neuromolecular mechanisms. So walk us through, you know, how uh, exercise can potentially upregulate. We've, we've We've touched on them a little bit already. You were talking about dopamine and serotonin and yes, maybe talk yeah. a little bit about BDNF and how that can how how that can also contribute to reducing systemic inflammation as well. I, I think uh, uh, first of all, this is there is a clear link between exercise and various benefits we have. Especially let's look at the microbiome. Like if you exercise, studies have shown people who exercise, and when I say exercise, it doesn't mean you have to kill yourself. Right. Moderation, right. Right. <laughs> moderation, you know, half an hour a day, you go for a walk your dog. And I really think this is very important because sometimes people take it to the extremes. I am a, a moderate uh, man in, <laughs> in, every, in everything. And I think this should apply to exercise before we go into its benefit. Number one, now that we, we covered that is, it will increase the diversity of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Remember, we said the more diverse, the better we are. Also, it looks like it keeps a balance between the beneficial microbes and the pathogen, okay? And we, we, we studies have shown, as you, as you alluded to, exercise can increase the brain dopamine, which is, as you know, it's a feel good. Uh, endorphin, as well as serotonin, which is, you know, feeling uh, of well-being and happiness occurs when you uh, exercise, okay? The other thing which is bring us by, back to inflammation is that exercise can reduce many inflammatory conditions, which of course influence uh, depression. 
Finally, exercise also can help us with respect to the gut lining, okay? It, it, will, it will help intestinal barrier dysfunction. So you can see when you put it all together, it's very beneficial. However, if you don't exercise, you are gonna have uh, imbalance. And when you have imbalance, you have multiple neuropsychiatric disorders, including uh, depression. That's why I always uh, recommend, listen, at least 15 to 20 minutes a day, uh, moderate activity is fine. Don't uh, be uh, too much stressed out. I have a dog. I have to say this because honest to God, my dog uh, is a, a border collie and his name is Prince. <laughs> and <laughs> I take him for walks. Honestly, last night I was so, yesterday I was so busy. I went home five o'clock. I say, okay, I have to take Prince for a walk. And I took him 40 minutes. Oh my goodness. At the end of it, honestly, I felt great. I told my wife, you know what? I really love this dog. <laughs> it's good for him. It's good for me because it took me walking. And also I am out in nature. So that's another way to have exercise. One of the things that I think is really interesting uh, that you just mentioned is it does exactly the opposite of what COVID does in the microbiome. So you mentioned COVID decreases the micro microbial diversity, increases opportunistic pathogens, and exercise literally does the opposite. It increases the, microbi the microbial diversity <laughs> and decreases these opportunistic pathogens. And this is, you know, when we look at some of the fatalities and some of the people who've had a really hard time with the COVID-19 infection, it is is those who have been metabolically unhealthy, likely, you know, not eating the Mediterranean style diet that we've been talking about and probably not moving enough as well. And as you said, you know, there's different ways to define exercise. Walking is probably one of my favorite things to do. On, I'm actually standing right now. I can't see it, but I'm on a treadmill. <laughs> so I, when I work in front of my computer, I just walk and I love the idea of going out in nature. And, you know, right now it's sort of fall. So you get to smell the leaves and, yeah, and all, oh. the, all the beautiful beautiful things, um, I, that come from going outside. So I, 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 I love that. And I think that this is, this is more of a long-term play, right? When we think exactly. about, when we think, and you know, when we think about healthy microbiome, I know fungi can be uh, manipulated much quicker, but when we, when we play, when we take a long-term view or long-term lens, exercise and diet, man, like we got to get, we got, we got to be doing those things and however you define it. So you like to walk, what are some other exercises that you might uh, counsel people or recommend that people engage in? I, you know, the other thing I loved, I used to go to a, a, life, a, a life's uh, a training place, you know, uh, and I used to go use elliptical, elliptical machine. I don't like to do a lot of running because, you know, at my age, sometimes I really think it affects my, uh, you know, joints. It's so hard on the I, joints. It really hard hurts in the joints. Yeah. So what yeah. I do, I do elliptical machine. Oh, it's really, really great. I love it. And I, I stopped going to the, uh, you know, gym uh, because I thought, let me buy, uh, that's what I do. I go and use the elliptical. So that's what, uh, so I bought an elliptical and I do it. More recently, uh, I started to do this uh, bike. I, sometimes it's boring, but now with all new, uh, this new Peloton and other, other companies coming out with these uh, uh, exercise uh, routines, Oh my God, I also love that. So what I do, I, in the morning, when I wake up, I am an early riser. I wake up, uh, uh, you know, and go directly to uh, exercise. I do half an hour, half an hour on the bike, okay? And then uh, be, when I do that, I don't so do elliptical. Uh, it will become too much, you know, I don't have a lot of time, but half an hour is great. Mm -hmm. And then in the, in the evening, I take my dog for a lot of walks. So that's what I do. Uh, uh, combined these days. What do you think about resistance training or weightlifting? Do you like that as an, as a strategy as well? You know, I started recently to do with my arm, like, you know, these there are program biking and arms and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I feel good about it. I really think as we get older, especially it's good to do this exercise because you make sure your muscles are uh, attuned and, you know, they don't, a sag and you become weak. It's good to, to exercise them. So now I do both uh, like cycling and arms, you know, even though 
uh, sometimes I say I need I need to do maybe separate, but you know because of the time I just. Right. Uh, but I really find it is is beneficial. It's beneficial. Yeah, and I think you're you're hitting both. You know, if you're doing the bike and the elliptical and the walking, you're hitting some of your major muscles in the lower limbs, and then the upper body. I mean, that's I think that's really important for men and women. You know, I'm thinking about you know when I am a grandmother, I want to be able to lift up my grandchild. I want to be able to get on the floor and play with my grandbabies, and I want to be able to take them to the park and you know travel, let's say, and be able to put you know a a, a, a you know a carry on in the overhead uh, bin. And in order to do that, you need upper body strength, and you also need lower body strength. So I'm, oh. I'm a huge advocate of, of resistance training as well. So I really agree with you. I, that's what I tell my wife uh, because we have grandkids, you know, and they add different uh, uh, flavor to our life. We are so <laughs> fortunate here, but I tell her, no, no, it's good. You should take care of them because it keeps you going. <laughs> keeps you young. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And for me, she she laughs at me. She said, you know, you are you are a troublemaker because when they come, they love to play with you because you don't tell them, don't do this, don't do that. It's me who tell them, don't do this, don't do that. <laughs> I say, listen, listen, my friend, it's nothing to do with me. I already brought up my kids now. I'm going to play with these guys. Exactly. That's what grandparents are for. They're supposed yeah. to just spoil their grandchildren yeah. because their parenting has been done. I love that. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the last uh, piece to your paper, which is around sleep. Yeah. Um, because again, uh, we mentioned earlier, an uh, increase in these anti-insomnia medications, um, which I think, you know, when, when you're taking things, uh, you know, I can't remember the name. What's the one with the butterfly? Um, oh, what, I can't remember the, dr the drug's name, but anyway, um, yeah. you know, you're not actually sleeping. You're just, they oh, knock oh, you yeah. out. Like the, you're unconscious. Um, Melatonin and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the changes and we can loop in the microbiome here as well. What are some of the changes that we see when we are sleep deprived? So whether it's staying asleep or well, I should say initiating sleep or maintaining sleep, what are some of the changes that we see to the microbiome when we are sleep deprived? I mean, when you are sleep deprived, like basically having sleep fragmentation, you know, you have a repetitive short interruption of sleep, really have been shown to, uh, again, decrease the diversity of the microbiome. You can see there are a couple of things. Diversity is very important and the balance of beneficial versus this. And studies have shown that if you have lack of sleep, which we defined it uh, uh, like sleep fragmentation, definitely can affect the diversity of the microbiome. However, when you have sleep, and it really have bi-directional effect with respect to our microbiome. The microbiome can affect sleep, but otherwise, if you don't sleep also, you can affect the microbiome. And what, what studies showed that sleep directly impact the microbiome in many ways. When you have good sleep, sleep efficiency, total sleep time, for example, this will support the two important things in the microbiome, the balance and diversity. Also, the positive effect of the microbiome on sleep really have been attributed to their ability to secrete, remember, the metabolites we talked about, butyric acid, gamma amino butyric acid, for example, which is a non-transmitter, a, a neurotransmitter known to promote sleep. So these organisms, they are secreting this a small molecule, which allows you to sleep better, okay? So you can see there is really direct relation between the two. And also I, I have found too, that when you are sleep, when you are sleep deprived, it actually affects your motivation to exercise, which we just talked oh, yeah. about. And it affects the, your food choices. When I have had to, you know, if I've had to stay up all night, let's say I'm thinking back to like my board exams, when I had to write boards, you know, I was eating crap. I was eating just like sugary bagels and like coffee filled <laughs> with sugar, you know, so we know that, that your motivation changes, but then when you're sleep deprived, from a physiological perspective, you have inferior fuel partitioning, like you are hyperinsulinemic and you tend to be, uh, you know, it's harder for you to get into fat burning and, you know, even just from a, uh, you know, an ATP product, like you're just dragging yes. your feet. You're so tired, right? Yes. Yes, definitely. This is true. You know, that's why like sometimes when you are not 
to, uh, motivated. You need to talk to yourself. Like sometimes I wake up in the morning and say, ah, oh, I'm tired. I don't want to go. And then I say, no, no, I have to go. <laughs> you know, right. so you have to motivate yourself. You have to work on it. And also at the same time, you you need to try. Sometimes we all love to have, you know, eat whatever, like donuts and whatever. So, look, once in a, while, uh, in a while, that's fine. As long as you are not having it every day. You know what I mean? As long as you, you need also to limit yourself in the amount of food you eat. Like sometimes I say to myself, okay, now I'm full, I should stop. <laughs> it's like, right. Right. you know, these things it will be important. It will help you to manage all that. And of course, by doing this, you are going to have better sleep because you are not uh, 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 too full. You have, you know, you don't feel well. You, you uh, it's, it's really very, very important. Uh, as you mentioned, if you eat the right way, it's going to help you in multiple ways. Not only it's going to improve your microbiome, which is going to improve your sleep. You also, once you have better sleep, also you have positive effects on that. So really all in all, it's, as you said, is a holistic approach that combine all these together to try to put you on the right, the right track. Let's, let's touch on supplementation uh, just as the last piece here. I know that this wasn't in your paper, but I think that it's important when we think about, I know that you have a company called Biome and one of the, whenever I've uh, had someone ask me like, should I take a probiotic? I've never really been a huge fan of them because I'm mean, saying this to you in the pre-chat, right? Often sure. they're dead on arrival. Like you can't, you know, it's like, it's like a hundred trillion billion in the, in the capsule and there's nothing there. Or they get, uh, you know, on, on contact with the acidity of the stomach, you know, the, 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 bi the, the, the microbiome yeah. that are the, the, I should say the, the probiotics are dead. Like they yeah. will, they will become, uh, they'll be killed by the acid and the digestive juices in the tract. So what are some ways if we are looking to reseed the gut, um, what would be something, and you can certainly talk about your product here. Uh, what are some of the things that we might be looking for in uh, supplement, in supplement form, whether that's a probiotic or anything else that you'd like to mention in terms of optimizing for micro microbial diversity and to help to balance out the fungi and, and the, um, and the bacteria. This is really very, very important topic. And you, you touched upon a number of things. Let's first start talking about the uh, fact that our stomach produces a lot of acids and there are some microbes that can be susceptible to this. In other words, high acidity will kill them, okay? So to me, the first thing is you need, if we go back and define probiotic, probiotic are live microbes. So we need them when they go down into our uh, gut to be live and not be killed by the acid, okay? So what I did with respect to our probiotic, our probiotic biome, the company, as you say, just for the sake of transparency, biome, B-I-O-H-M uh, health, biome health is what we produce the, uh, what we designed the probiotic there. The first thing I did is I wanted to come out what sort of organisms that we should have in our probiotic. Okay, what sort of strains in other words. And then I tried to do correlation analysis, identify strains that are able to antagonize the pathogen, but encourage the beneficial one, okay? Then I wanted to see, can they survive if they go through the gut? And we tested each strain its ability to grow in the presence of different levels of acidity, okay? Remember, the fungi, number one, loves acids. So fungi lives very nicely at low pH, okay? Now, when we tested the others, we found that a lot of them can sustain uh, uh, viability, you know, high enough, like 80% at low pH. I tested between 1.5 to uh, 5 pH of five, okay? So a lot of them uh, lived at a three, for example. Now, what I also did is I looked into the literature, I looked into the studies, and guess what? The acidity in our stomach is very high on an empty stomach. So that's why when I recommend now with our probiotic and any other probiotic for that matter, please take the probiotic after you eat some food because within 30 minutes, the 
pH goes from 1.52, it goes four to six, okay? Which means these organisms will be able to survive that. So that's one thing is very important. There is another way is when you put the capsule, the capsule itself is can stand the acidity of the stomach because you need the organism, they don't stay in the stomach. We want them to go down to a lower uh, intestinal tract, you know, the colon, for example. So that's what we uh, designed our probiotic uh, to do so that it can, and I published this work, I published the work about its effect on pH as well as uh, you know, the viability in that ma matter. Wonderful. Okay, well, we'll make sure that we have uh, the biome link uh, in our show notes as well. If people wanted to learn more about you and your work, I mean, I know we've already mentioned you've been, you know, cited 38,000 times in the <laughs> literature, so it's pretty easy to find you on PubMed. Uh, yes. But if somebody wanted to learn more about you or your company, where would you direct them? What, what website or where, where can people find you? They, they can find me on Biome Health, B I O H M Health.com. Uh, there is a lot of information there. Also, we have the Microbiome Report, is a podcast where it mentions also about health, uh, uh, you know, the various aspects of uh, health conditions uh, that describe. But biomehealth.com will be really very good to go. To. Wonderful. Okay, so we'll make sure that that's there for our listeners as well. Dr. Ganum, this has been just a delightful conversation. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your presence. And the I know this is going to be so useful uh, to my listeners because this, as I mentioned, you know, mental health and the microbiome, and this is not something that we can really ignore uh, anymore, especially with this pandemic, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I hope that some of the tips and tricks that you have, uh, that you have relayed here today are really going to help my listeners. Thank you so very, very much. It's my great pleasure and really thank you for having me. It was a delight. Thank you. Thank you.